Okay, section 5.3 is about inverse functions, and kind of like what we did in section 5.1, we're going to talk about a little bit of algebra before we ever get into the calculus, um, so that you can make sure to have those pieces in place um, in order to do the calculus. Um, the first thing is to simply talk about what inverses are. So a function g is the inverse function of f. If when you compose them, that's not multiplication, that's not f times g, that's f composed with g of x, equals x for each x in the domain of g, and if you compose them in the other order, g composed with f of x equals x for each domain of f, each x in the domain of f. Um, the function g is actually got a notation if it is in fact the inverse, and the inverse notation looks like a um, negative 1 as an exponent. It isn't a negative 1 exponent, that's the notation for it. So when we read that as f inverse, okay. so this is, does not mean 1 over f, but that's not the notation. This is, this is one of those mathy things that's just unfortunate that we use the same symbol for multiple representations, right? This means f inverse. All right, so we're going to actually show that a couple of functions are inverses, just as a reminder. Again, this is, this is a college algebra concept. Um, so if we have two functions, f of x and g of x, and we want to show that they're inverses analytically, that means, you know, using what we just saw as the definition, um, we're going to do with that with composition. So we have to do the composition in two directions. We have to do f composed g of x. And after we show that that one equals x, we're going to have to do it in the other order. So what this actually means is that I have the g of x function, which is x minus 1 over 5, that gets replaced for where g of x is. And then I take that value and I plug it into the f of x function everywhere I saw an x. You guys remember that idea? I mean, you've used it a lot in calculus too, but so we would end up with 5 times x minus 1 over 5 and then plus 1. And then we would simplify. So what simplifies? The 5's cancel, which leaves me technically with x minus 1 plus 1 and yeah, the negative 1, the positive 1 cancel, leaving me with just x. Okay, so that's half of it, and then the other half of it is to do the composition in the other order. So we're going to do g composed f of x, and, and I realize um, you guys are not in college algebra, but you do need to show me a couple of steps along the way in this so that I know that you're processing through it correctly. You're not just skipping something because you didn't understand what it meant, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and write it out um, as I'm doing it, but you may skip some of these steps. So this would be g of the f of x function is 5x plus 1. And then what that means is to take that 5x plus 1 and plug it into the g of x equation everywhere you had an x. So that would mean we'd have, in this case, 5x plus 1 minus 1 over 5. So what happens first? Right, this is plus 1 and minus 1. I know there's parentheses there, but they're only separating, multi they're not separating multiplication, they're separating addition and subtraction, so they don't really have a lot of effect. That leaves me with 5x over 5, and then the 5s cancel, leaving me with x. Okay, so that's showing it analytically. Okay, if you have your calculator with you, grab your calculator for me. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to show them that they are inverses graphically. So what does that mean? Well, it means what we're going to do is we're going to plug three equations into your calculator. We're going to plug in f of x, we're going to plug in g of x, and we're going to plug in a third one as well. So in your calculator, you're going to do y1 as the f of x function. You're going to do y2 as the g of x function. And you're going to do y3 as simply x. They're all going to be lines, by the way, so don't be surprised when that happens. I'm going to actually put in the third line first on my picture on the board. Okay, this is the line y equal x, which is your y3. All right, I guess I could be doing this with you. I I should. 
Um, a 10 by 10 window is sufficient um, to look at this, um, so you don't need to change that, or you can put that back in standard window if it is changed currently. You can do that by doing a zoom 6 if you're unfamiliar with where that button is. So did you get three lines that all look like they cross very close to the origin? They don't cross the origin, but real close to there? Okay, great. So one of those lines, which line was the steepest? Y1 or Y2? Yep, Y1. So that one actually was above my red line on my screen up here, right? And you know from algebra, looking at the equation 5x plus 1, that it actually crosses above the origin at x equals positive 1. So it looked something like this, if you were to zoom in and look at it carefully. Okay, So that right there is the f of x equation. And then you had a function that was actually got a very, has a very shallow kind of a slope. It's not very steep at all, right? By comparison, anyway. Let's do green. And you also know that if you were to carefully look at how the equation sort of parses out, it also crosses the y-axis, but it crosses the y-axis at a negative value because the equation actually had a negative 1 on top and a 5 on bottom. So it crosses very, very shallowly, um, very close to the origin, but at negative 1 fifth. And it looks something like this. Now, this isn't the best one to tell this on, but it's not too bad. If you take a look at this, I want you to imagine folding your calculator screen or folding my iPad screen along the red line. If you folded the screen along the red line, what do you notice happens with the green and the blue? Yeah, they line up. They would land on top of one another, right? So this actually looks like that there's some symmetry involved, and that's not by default. Anytime you're doing inverse functions, they're going to be inverses if they're symmetric around the line y equal x. That is, the top half of that blue line, if it were folded down across the red line, would land on the right half of the green line. And the same thing on the bottom half of the blue line, if it were folded, it would actually fold up to the left half of the green line. Okay, so we fold, then they actually match up. So there is symmetry with respect to the line y equal x when you do inverses. And um, I want to show you a couple other things um, algebra-wise that we're going to take a look at. And the first thing is the idea of something being one-to-one. -one. And a few of you will take more math beyond this. I know many of you won't, but one-to-one -one is something, these pieces are actually something, again, you see in college algebra, but you use them throughout mathematics past this course as well. I mean, you see this used in upper-level mathematics courses, these ideas. Um, a one-to-one -one function is a function for which every y value corresponds to a unique, unique x value. That is, if you have two y values that match, so some f of a equals f of b, that meant that A equaled to B to begin with. Graphically, the way you can decide that is the horizontal line test. So you probably remember another line test as well. What was it called? The vertical line test. So what the vertical line test did is it, it actually, you, you drew bunches of vertical lines, at least on the paper in your head, and you said, does it cross the graph more than once, up and down, right? And if it didn't, we actually called that graph a graph of a function. Are you with me? Horizontal line test works the same way. The horizontal line test, though, is horizontal lines instead of vertical lines. And the question you're asking yourself again is, does it cross the graph more than once? And if it crosses the graph more than, I'm sorry, if it doesn't cross the graph more than once, then it's called a one-to-one -one function. So a graphical line test for deciding the, um, this is a graphical line test for deciding if the function is one-to-one. -one. So can you imagine a picture of a graph? There's a very common one you should be familiar with that is not one-to-one. -one. That is, when you draw a horizontal line, it crosses the graph more than once. x squared, right? y equal x squared is the classic case one that fails the horizontal line test. So the graph looks something like this. It's not a perfect graph because I didn't even hit the origin, but pretend. And if you draw horizontal lines, it crosses more than once, almost all the time, in fact, right? So we would say that this is not a one-to-one -one function. Now let me go back to the definition of one-to-one -to, -one to explain why that works. So let's imagine then that this is the horizontal line we're talking about. What that means is that those two y values at that particular level are the same thing. Let's actually give them a number. Let's say that they are 4. This is at y equal 4. Okay? It's y equals 4 in both places. The problem is that there's two x values that would have given you that, negative 2 
positive 2. So I actually don't have the feature that when f of a equals f of b, that is when two y values match, like this 4, that the x values had to match. These x values do not match, yet they gave me the same y value. So that's where the, the relationship is coming from. <coughs> um, strictly monotonic means that a fun this is a function which is strictly increasing or decreasing on its entire domain. So all the values that you're considering as being legitimate values for the function um, it is always going uphill or it is always going downhill, and that's called strictly monotonic. So in other words, you don't have anything like this parabola going on, right? Because this is going downhill at first, and then it's going uphill afterwards. So that's not allowed. That's not strictly monotonic. The other thing that's not strictly monotonic is anything that would have any places where it's absolutely flat for a period of time, right? So horizontal line is not strictly monotonic. And any graph that has a portion of that wouldn't be either. All right, so let me talk about when you actually have an inverse exist. And this is why we just talked about these last features. A function has an inverse if and only if it is one to one. So what that actually means is this function y equal x squared does not have an inverse, right? Because it's not one to one. And the second thing that we're going to talk about is if f is strictly monotonic on its entire domain, that means it's strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, then it is one-to-one. -one. So can you imagine if you have a graph that's always going uphill, are you always able to draw these horizontal lines? Yes. So it is going to be monotonic. It's going to be one-to-one. -one. And therefore, it would have an inverse. Okay? Therefore, it has an inverse function. Okay, so I've got a function here that's not quite so simple as y equal x squared. And it wants us to use the horizontal line test to determine if the function's one to one and therefore has an inverse. So what does that mean you're going to do? You're going to graph it. So grab your calculator. If you don't have yours with you, look at a neighbor's, but please start bringing them if you're not. Go ahead and clear out our equations from the last section. And I want you to put in what you've got here. Now do be careful if you're dealing with the x squared, that the parentheses show up correctly and so forth. So you have 5x, you've got your square root. It should be a parenthesis if the calculator doesn't force one in there. Make sure yours has one. And then do that x minus 1 completely in parentheses. Just keep it in the standard viewing window. I think that'll be okay for this. So zoom 6 or just hit graph if you zoom 6 last time. And we'll start from there anyway. All right, so what does it look like right now? Does it look weird? Yeah. Yeah, it looks weird, doesn't it? It looks something like um, that. That's kind of what it looks like, just this random. And, but you guys know this is not a line. I mean, you can look at the equation and tell me that's not a line, right? And hopefully you remember what squares, square root equations kind of look like. They kind of look like a sideways parabola or a half of one. So you kind of should have the feel that it might should have some of that feature going on, and this particular graph does not look very good for doing that. So let's talk a little bit about how you can get your calculator to uh, cooperate and show a few more things that are more helpful than this. One thing you can do by looking at the graph that we've already drawn is you can see that you don't have any negative x's or negative y's here going on, right? That's a helpful feature. So the first thing I want us to do is I want you to hit your window button, and I want you to make your x minimum 0 and your y minimum 0, and just hit graph again. The picture is not going to be a lot better in terms of it being sort of looking like a straight line, but it's going to look a little bit closer in. Are we good so far? Well, what I really want to do is I really want to see what happens further out along the x-axis, because right now it's shooting off my screen. Agreed? All right. There's a really cool button in your calculator, don't know if you know about it, but that will help you do that. You can hit zoom, and it's option, I think it's zero. Yep, option zero. So hit the number zero or arrow down to zero. It's called zoom fit. What zoom fit does is it takes the x axis minimum, you know, the x minimum, x maximum that you put in from the window, and it alters the y minimum and y maximum to be the best fit for the x minimum maximum you put in. So you actually end up, and you should see along the left hand side of your screen that the y axis became really bold. Is that what it looks like? Because what it actually did is you've got a lot more values along that y-axis now than you had before. 
But do you see curvature now in your graph? Yeah, you do. In fact, it's curvature that actually doesn't look like what I sort of thought it might, right? The square root of x sort of looked like a parabola, you know, sideways, half of it opening down. And this one sort of looks like this a little bit. It's got a little bit of curvature, okay? We're not going to work too much here on the um, scale, but just so that you can see it, hit window again. What does it say your y maximum is? 150 is what mine says too. So right now your y minimum is, it's around zero. Mine actually says it's uh, 1.3. But you've got your y minimum almost at the x-axis and it's going up to 150 while the x-axis only goes from zero to 10. Yes, well, pardon. Says, uh, 67. Okay, let me take a look. All right, so does, does everybody see this kind of looks like this graph? Does your graphs all look like this, more or less? All right, so the question actually wanted us to do, or the question actually asked us to do, is to determine if this is one-to-one. -one. So, um, is it? Yes. Yes, why? Because yeah, every horizontal line crosses this thing only once, right? So, yes, this actually works. Um, so, this one is one-to-one. -one. Because it passes the horizontal line test. A little bit too, too low there. Hang on. Um, therefore, it has an inverse right? So this one does, in fact, have an inverse. I didn't spell inverse, right? Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so here's the important thing to do. If you're trying to find an inverse for a function, which we're about to do this, uh, the first thing you need to make sure is that it's one-to-one. -one. Because if you start with a function that's not one-to-one -one and you're trying to find an inverse, you'll find something uh, but number one, you will have done a whole lot of work, and the reason you will have done a whole lot of work is because number two, that inverse actually that you're finding doesn't exist. Are you with me? So this is the step that students often forget in the process. The question says, find the inverse if it exists. So the first thing you've got to figure out is, is it going to exist? And you can do it pretty quickly because you've got graphing calculators, and you could look to see, does it pass the horizontal line test? Because if it doesn't, then you're really well done, and you can just say, it doesn't have one. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. And it will have taken you like two minutes to do the problem, and somebody else is going to be spinning their wheels finding something that doesn't exist. Are you with me? So this actually is a really important step. So let's talk then about if you do have an inverse like this one does, how you go about finding it. Okay, so the way you first find an inverse is you first determine, is it one-to-one? -one? I just almost feel like I should be doing a flow chart, and a flow chart says, if no, stop, don't do any more work. <laughs> if yes, continue down with two, three, four, and so forth. Okay? All right, so if it has a one, I mean, if it is one to one, then it will have an inverse. And the question is, what do you do? Well, you let the function notation, which you started with, actually be equal to the value y. So you just call it y. So instead of saying f of x equals 3x squared plus 2x plus 9, you'd say y equals. Then you switch the x and the y variable. So could you combine steps one and two? Yeah, you could. You guys have enough mathematical maturity to handle that. My college algebra students wouldn't. Um, but yeah, you could, you could do step one and two at the same time. Um, the goal, though, however, is that when you switch these guys, you're going to solve for what you have previously had called x that you're now calling y. Okay, so you're going to solve for the new y. Once you solve for the new y, you're going to replace that notation y with the notation f inverse of x. And you're going to define the domain. Is it all real numbers? Is it x greater than 2? Is it all x values but 7? That kind of thing. And the last thing to do is to verify your answer. And the way you verify your answer is there's a couple of ways. If the problem specifically tells you to verify your answer, um, they're looking for an analytical verification. 
Okay, that's the first way we did this over here. They're looking for this. If it doesn't tell you you have to verify, then you could simply graph to make sure that it seems like a reasonable solution. The graph, all that does is tell you if it's reasonable, not for sure if it's exact. So there is a little bit of fallout there that you could be making still an error. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at one. We have a function here. It's f of x equals x cubed minus 1. And what do I need to do first when the directions say find the inverse? Graph it. Why in the world do I want to graph it? It didn't tell me to graph it. Yeah. i got to make sure that I'm actually going to have an inverse. So go ahead and take your graph, your calculator, put in x cubed minus 1, put it back in the standard window, okay? Zoom 6, or negative 10 to 10, <coughs> negative 10 to 10. Okay, so what does it look like? You're drawing this picture in the air with your hands. How's that? So it looks something like that? Yeah. yeah. It actually crosses slightly above the x-axis depending on um, how your calculator, how you're looking at your calculator. It might look like it's almost on the x-axis. Well, it says it won't show me that it's below the x-axis. Yeah. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. I didn't graph mine. You're right. It is. Hang on. Draw that a little bit better. Sorry about that. Yes, you're right. It is. Um, and that's because of the negative one at the end. Thank you for correcting me. Yes. All right, so what do you think? Is it one to one? Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yeah, it does. Every horizontal line will only cross it one time, so we are good to continue through steps two through six. Okay? All right, so step two, I'm going to actually write the steps out as I go. So this is sort of step one, was to verify that it had this one to one feature. Step two was to call this y equals x cubed minus one. And step three was to switch where the x and the y are. So this is x equals y cubed minus 1. All right, so far so good? So if you jumped to step three and didn't write step two down, I'm going to live with that just fine. But what am I supposed to do next? Solve for y, solve for y which involves algebra, right? So what's my first step to solve for y? Add 1. Yep, to isolate it. Uh huh. And then what? Cubed root. Cubed root. So this is the cubed root now of x plus 1 equals y. So I have now solved for y. Just fine. What does step 5 say I'm supposed to do? Right, and I'm going to move it to the left-hand side. So this is f inverse of x equals the cube root of x plus 1. Okay, I haven't gotten to that point yet. All right, um, so taking a look at that then, um, we need to define the domain. So let's think about this. Think about what you might remember about cube roots. Um, let's pause and change in our minds for a moment and talk about square roots. If this were a square root, there would be a concern. What would the concern be if I were dealing with square roots? Yeah, the concern would be about negatives. No negatives underneath the square root, right? Do we have that same concern with cube roots? No, we don't. I can have a negative underneath a cube root. And you've seen it before, but just as a reminder, if you have the cube root of negative 8, that's negative 2. Because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. Okay, so it's perfectly fine to have a negative underneath a cube root. Can I have a zero underneath a cube root? Yeah. What's the cube root of zero? Yeah. It's just zero. So for this one, the domain is all real numbers. There's no negatives. There's no zero issues, anything like that. If I were dealing with square roots, this would be a different issue, right? But because it's cube roots, I'm good to go. So my domain here, and you can write it one of two ways, is either all real numbers. That's one notation for it. Or you may have remembered writing it as negative infinity to infinity. If you really want to write that in words, the domain is all real numbers. You could do that. But you need to write it in some way, shape, or form, what the domain is. What was step six? Verify. Verify. And in fact, part B on this problem asks you to graph them anyway. So we're going to do step six inside of part B. Okay? Part B says graph F and its inverse on the same axis. And you already have the graph of F on your screen. So just go into Y2, 
and plug in your new um, function that you found, which was cube root of x plus 1. And if you would for me, in y3, go ahead and plug in x equals, I'm sorry, equals x, or just x. That's what we had earlier, right? With the line y equal x imposed on there. And you should be getting a graph that looks something like this. I'm going to see if I can graph it well. <coughs> uh, try that color. It could be worse. <coughs> Does it look something like that but better in your calculator? Um, mine sort of gives the illusion that the pink graph is sort of further away than the blue graph is from the red line, and it shouldn't look like that. It also sort of gives the illusion that the inverse is sort of flattening out, and it doesn't really do that either. But it looks something like this in your calculator. Close enough, anyway, yeah? All right, so it says graph f and its inverse on the same set of axes. You should label them. Okay, so if you're doing this and it tells you to graph on, the, on your homework, um, that means you're going to graph inside of your calculator, but then you have to draw the graph for me because otherwise I don't know if you graphed or not. Um, so you're just going to draw it. It's a sketch, so don't expect it to be perfect. However, it should look reasonable, okay? So if it's far off and I can't sort of have the image in my mind of folding it and making that look sort of reasonable, then, then you need to redraw um, so if you take a look, though, there's a few things that do happen, and they happen right here. They should be crossing each other <coughs> at the x-axis, okay? Not the x-axis, the, the third y equal for you, y equal x, okay? Down here. The other thing is that the, notice how far this is away, that she would match it over here. This is not a good graph. But this distance should be the same as this distance, because that's how it's going to fold down on each other. All right, I want us to take a look at a couple more sort of features about this because there's some really interesting things that go on. This says describe the relationship between the graph. So we already talked about this. So what would be a verbal description of how you could describe how these graphs are related? The graphs, what? They are inverses. What does that mean in a picture point of view? They're, okay, so I'm hearing a lot of things, but I think I've got it. So they're, what was the word? Symmetric. symmetric, that'll work. Okay, the graphs are symmetric. Around the line y equal x. Another similar description is you could say that one of them is a reflection of the other one over the line y equal x. You've used that language before. Here's an interesting feature, the next one. We already did, we already wrote the domain of one of them, but we're going to do the domain and the range of each of them. So this is f, and then we're going to do f inverse. We're going to do the domain and the range and the domain and the range. And it's not going to be very exciting on this one, but I want to make an observation with you about something that happens in general when you're dealing with the domain and the range. Okay, so taking a look at your original function, which one over here is the blue one, what is the domain of that blue function? All real numbers, um, because I can go to the left as far as I want and to the right as far as I want, and I have points along my blue curve. So the domain is all real numbers, and I'm going to use the negative infinity to infinity notation, just because that's what I picked. You can use whatever you like. What is the range on that blue one? Yeah, it's also negative infinity to positive infinity, right? I mean, we can go down as far as we want and up as far as we want on the blue curve. Okay, now I'm dealing with the inverse function, which is the pink one. 
What is the domain of the pink one? Yeah, it's also negative infinity to infinity. And without belaboring the point, what was the range? The same. Yeah. Now, so it sort of looks like they all sort of matched up, and they did on this one. But let me show you in general what really happens. What really happens is that the domain of one is the range of the other. That's the actual sort of pairing that happens. And the reason is this. Go back to step three. What was step three in finding an inverse? Switch the x and y. And x represents what of these quantities? The domain. And y represents the range. So when I'm finding inverses, what I'm doing is switching the x and the y. Hence, I'm switching the domain and range. So that's always going to happen. Okay. So when you're looking at these, you should always have that matching up in that way. Again, not real exciting on this one because they all happen to be all real numbers. All right, last topic in this section is about continuity. So we're going to let f be a function whose domain has some interval i, and it has an inverse. Okay, so we're talking about a one-to-one -one function. Then if f is continuous, then f inverse is continuous. If f is increasing, then f inverse is increasing. If f is decreasing, yeah, f inverse is decreasing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same, same kind of features. And the last one says if f is differentiable on an interval containing c, and as long as the derivative itself is not zero, then I didn't have it written in here yet. F prime of C is not zero. Then F inverse is differentiable at F of C. Pink is not the best color, is it? Okay, so let's take a uh, function here, and we'll take a look at some of this information. We're supposed to use the derivative to determine if the graph is strictly monotonic and therefore has an inverse. Okay? So um, a few things it said right there is it says we're supposed to use a derivative. Agreed? Okay. So we need to take the derivative, and um, I need, in order to take the derivative, I might, in fact, want to do what you guys suggested a little bit earlier on a different problem and rewrite this as 4x to the negative 2. Agreed? Yeah, then I don't have to use any quotient rules, right? That's a handier way of doing it. Okay, so what's the derivative? Uh, negative 8x to the negative 3. Is that good? And if you wanted to rewrite that sort of in the notation that it was originally given to you in, it would look like negative 8 over x cubed. All right, so look back at rule number 4 or whatever. This is property number 4 from your uh, theorem. Property number 4 says f is dif differentiable on the interval containing c, um, if f is differentiable on the interval containing c, and f prime of c is not 0. So take a look at this function, negative 8 over x cubed. And notice again, my domain is actually from 0 to infinity. Okay? So I can't include 0. There's a parenthesis there. It means I don't actually get to include 0. So imagine using numbers like 1 or 1 half as your sort of minimum bound. If I put in any kind of positive number, because that's what those are, if you put in a positive number in the denominator here, what are you going to get out of the derivative? It is negative, right? Okay, so that's interesting information. It's negative. And in particular, that means it's not zero, right? And that's the feature that we were actually looking for on part four down here is the fact that it was not zero. So f prime of x does not equal zero on the interval zero 
to infinity. Okay. We also established the fact that it was always negative on that interval, didn't we? f prime of x is negative on 0 to infinity. What does it mean if a derivative is always negative? The original function is decreasing. You guys remember that from when you learned about concavity and um, maximums and minimums and inflection points and all of those kinds of features back in Calc 1? All right, well, that's a good feature here. So since f prime of x is always negative, f of x is always decreasing. And that inf the word always here is the key word because the fact that it's always doing it makes it monotonic. It's strictly decreasing. It's always decreasing. Hence, it's always doing either the increasing or the decreasing one or the other, which makes it monotonic. So f of x is strictly monotonic. Monotonic is one of those words like the word sibling. When you use the word sibling, it means you have a brother or a sister, right? When you use the word monotonic, it means it's increasing or it's decreasing. It's sort of a general word to describe two different features, but they have kind of the same relationship to you, right? Like the sibling situation does. Um, all right, and we already said that it has an inverse, right? Um, let me write, actually write that down. And f prime of x not equaling 0 means um, f of x has an inverse on the interval 0 to infinity, or on the <laughs> you could say on that domain. Any questions on that one? Okay. 